Hello everybody, I'm Dehame from the Hammer Game Channel and welcome back finally to TNO. We've taken a little bit of a break from it, not gonna lie. Um, but we are back and we are playing as the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, I'm guessing this is probably gonna turn into a very um very dark playthrough, probably. And what already is a pretty dark mod. So let's have a wee read about the Aryan Brotherhood. And just an FYI, got the cold again, so I'm blowing my nose like a madman again, which is just great. It's only been about three weeks. <coughs> You'll probably start calling me King Doon, um, King of the Colds. That's, that's what we're going for now. Anyways, the failure of the West Russian War left deep scars in the Russian psyche. Three times Russia had fought during the century, each resulted in defeat and collapse. To many, it was starting to seem that the Nazis' claim on racial superi superiority held weight, and the Russian people could never have the strength to stand against the German Ubermensch. Some accepted this as a sad fact of life and resigned themselves in fear of the master race, but one man refused to accept his subjugation. As Russia fell into anarchy once more, Guthrum Wagner gathered a band of derelicts and de degenerates around him. himself. For him, the West Russian War was had been an awakening. He had seen the might of the master race on display as the Germans had crushed the West Russian Revolutionary Front. Wagner knew he held the same strength within himself, as did the men around him. They were the first of many to realise that Arianism was not physical, but psychological. In the woods I saw the perm, these men pledged to destroy the Slavic tyrants and had oppressed the Ubermensch of the East for so long. Wagner proclaimed himself Fuhrer of the Aryan Brotherhood and Russia's nightmare was born. Words, word of the Brotherhood's doctrine spread quickly and before long Wagner's following had grown into thousands, bolstered by men seeking everything from redemption to safety to copious amounts of violence, all of which the Brotherhood offered. <coughs> Since then the time had come to begin his crusade, the Fuhrer and his army stormed into Perm, slaughtering the Slavic warlords that had ruled the city and declaring the birth of a new Aryan civilization that would liberate the Ubermensch in the East, just as Germany had done in the West. The first step was to purify the newly chris um, christened Perhem. Perhem? Killing or enslaving the Ubermensch that still lived within the city. <coughs> I apologise for this, guys. Uh, since capturing Permheim, per I don't know how to say that right, the Brotherhood continued to pillage Western Russia. Scouring the east for loot, slaves and the rare Aryan, uh, Aryans hidden among the Slavic masses. Waiting to be uplifted by their more enlightened brothers to the subhuman warlords of the region, the Brotherhood is a band of savages led by a madman. The Fuhrer knows better. He's your leader Ubermensch in the last conquest of the East, finally purging Slavic corruption from Russia soil and securing the destiny of the Aryan race once and for all. So, the features. We have indoctrinate worthy Russians in Aryanism to ensure the rule of the master race. That already sounds just fab. And decide the future Aryan race as either warriors or masters and codify the definition of Aryanism and decide who's worthy of the title Ubermensch. And I'm not going to say that, but destiny lies ahead. So, we start off with to research lots, which I think will just, um, yeah, let's just go mass production and let's go ahead and get practical industrial administration beneath the hooked cross. It is a sad fact that we stand far below our German masters. The rule over an empire spans half of Europe. We barely rule over the city of Perm and its surroundings. I'm just going to say Perm. As far as we know, they likely either have no knowledge or are only vaguely aware of us. If we are to be loyal servants of the Reich, we must stand uh, start by consolidating our control of the territories under our control and building the institutions of a proud Germanic nation. Every aspect of the state needs to be moulded according to the Brotherhood doctrine. We need more Aryans to run the government and military and more labourers and slaves to work our factories. Yeah, just the thought of slaves during this is just really summing up how this is going to go. Our ideology needs to be clarified and applied to every part of life. With enough time and effort, we can build a nation that the Germans would be proud to witness. So are we wanting the Germans to be happy with us? Is that what we're going for here? Are we wanting the Germans to like Because if so, that is interesting. Well, I guess it makes sense. We're the Aryan Brotherhood. But um, we're in a kind of position that we've not really been in. I've not really fought over in here before. We, this is the first time we're fighting over here because I've played as Sverdlovsk, which has been in this area. We've played as Siberian Black Army, which is in this area. We have played as... Oh, that's only two rushes, isn't it, that we've played as? Yeah, it's only two rushes we've played as. Okay, anyways, that's that done. 
beneath the hooked cross. As he was led to the sermon room, Dmitri Polachev tried to calm his racing thoughts. He recalled wisdom from the doctrine. The mind had a hierarchy of thoughts, just as the body had a hierarchy of blood. Fear dealt an anxiety of the brain patterns of vermin. Arians thought only of strength and courage, violence and conquest. Nervousness was a vestige of inferiority. Inferiority he would soon leave behind. After what felt like an eternity, he reached the end of the long corridor and entered the grand hall. Arians, members of the organization, sat in a horseshoe surrounding the center of the room, with a cloaked higher ranked member on an elevated seat in the center. Dmitri dropped to his knees instinctively. Initiate Polichev, rise. The hooded figure spoke in a soft voice, and nevertheless carried through the chamber. He obeyed, attempting to mimic the di uh, dignified feature of the Nordic ideal as he stood. You have performed admirably in the trials. Serve with unflinching loyalty in all of the duties of the initiate. You have sworn the oaths of Folk, Reich, and Führer. You have proven yourself as one among the elect. Revel in the worthiness of your blood, Matthias Gretzfield. Welcome to the Aryan Brotherhood. The seated members clapped politely as Matthias received the proof of his spirit, a swastika pin, which he proudly attached to his lapel. His haughty posture and affect, uh, affectation only a few minutes before was now genuine. He felt pride and hatred uh, pervade him to the bone. He was part of a small elite class high above the millions of vermin that filled Russia and would die before relinquishing the status. The Aryan Brotherhood gains another member. 30 political power and 5 stability. <coughs> oh god, this is going to be a long video of me sneezing. A city on war footing, bolstering our ranks or instilling fear. Let's go for bolstering our ranks. <laughs> oh, I do apologise about this, guys. I gotta get these videos done. Though it's a fact born out of its, its definition, the Aryan is within but a few of us. We acknowledge this sad, perhaps inconvenient truth, that the lesser peoples have no place among our ranks. We look towards Germany with not only admiration, but also envy, with so many of the chosen people their continent-spanning empire is destined to be eternal and without its equal. In the vastness of Russia, and its land and its folk, we are but a mere moat of dust. The situation must be rectifi rectified. Though they may be rare, there are Russians, just like ourselves, who are worthy in blood and deed to become one of us and ascend. However, these will not come to us befitting their worth, and we must seek them out. In the silence of the night, when the bombers die down, we shall search for them. We shall take them, forcibly if needed. For the blood yearns to, rejo uh, to rejoin from its kin. Search for the chosen. Yeah, this is already pretty messed up. I'm not gonna lie. Anyways, uh, Gitrun is our our field marshal, and um, Leon Muller. Welcome. I don't know who we're actually gonna be invading first, but I guess I'll just sit there. Oh my days, the purified Aryan Brotherhood. Oh, oh. The rate of ascension. Adds a flat 1,500 manpower, an additional 500 manpower for each one state. Strength of the Brotherhood's control gains 2,500 manpower and extreme control over non Aryans. Yeah, I'm not going to be purchasing your equipment. And the assassin has struck the Fuhrer. Got this cup of tea is probably going to help me. More planning. I don't think we really need to do any of this. Um, how many factories have we got? One seventy three military. And Borman's been named the successor. Okay, right. What do we got now? <coughs> so much reading, but so is the way of Tino. Dimitri's night was quiet. The German planes had stopped in the woods where he lived. All was silent, save for the crackling of the fire. And the still whispering band of men sitting around, sitting around him. The air stirred. He drew a long stretch of his cigarette, watching the embers bloom and fade to grey. Along with the aroma of the tobacco, the images of home and family entered his mind, filling his thoughts in a gentle, smoking haze. He shook the cigarette gen gingerly and let its ashes dissipate into the wind. Warm and comfortable, he felt his eyelids sag and dozed off. He awoke to the sounds of boot trampling through the forest. Some of the men had abandoned their places already, leaving behind whatever they had taken to the s sacred place. In the distance, Dimitri could hear the faint revving of a truck. Then the gunshots came. Men dressed in black uniforms emerged into the clearing. 
He and the rest of the companion of the companions huddled together, as the yoke of these men slowly wound themselves closer. Don't be alerted, he heard a voice say. His runner strolled behind his men. Oh, uh, his hand clasped behind his uh, behind his hip. Rejoice instead, for the Brotherhood has come to you this night to deliver neither death nor doom, but hope. He paused, looking at Dimitri. He went closer into the circle and squatted down, gently running his fingers through Dimitri's rough cheeks and beard. I can feel that we are of the same blood already, brother. He stood up, looking straight into Dimitri's eyes and said, If you'd only still your shivers, then you would be worthy. Bending down, he put his palms on Dimitri's shoulder. There is always an opportunity to improve. Now get up. He offered his hand and Dimitri grasped it without hesitation. Good, good, brother, he said, swinging his arm around Dimitri's neck. Now follow us. He looked at the rest of the companions in content and said, Liquidate the rest. Dimitri dared not look back, even as the screams ensued and ceased. The Brotherhood grows, but we've also just killed some people off. That is, um... Great. The German bombers fly over the sk our skies. The swimsuit probably em em embolised on both its wings. Beautiful airborne teachers that instruct the lesser peoples to know their place. That they find us unequal is no surprise. However, despite the fact of our apparent superiority to the un uh, Untermensch, we are no closer to reaching the heights of our brethren in Germany. Instead, we wander, not knowing what path to pursue to enlighten ourselves. In our current state, the Fuhrer, the godly and divine being that commands the Germans, will look at us in content. Uh, silent. To him, we are no different from the Russians. Our perfection is being useless, without guidance and destiny. He like, he, like the plains above, offers no counsel nor advice. However, where he quietens, we must speak. The Brotherhood should gather, and all the words said shall pave the road that we must walk. <coughs> this is um, the the doctrinization that's going to go on during this is going to be incredible. Oh, I'm actually going to have to fight Omega this time as well for once, which means I'll have to go to war with the Finns. Yeah, we have a lot of enemies to deal with. Oh yeah, I didn't even think. Um, we do have the Luftwaffe terror bombings, of course. We have Aryan Cult, which is giving us plus 15 organization, minus 15 recruitment population factor, plus 10 division attack. And Aryan Control Loose, which is giving us 5 stability, 5 more support. Aryan Control is, of course, going to skyrocket in the coming weeks and months. We don't have to worry about them. We do have the self to worry about. Because I think... Or maybe we don't. Maybe we do. A warrior caste or an overseer caste. Let's read both of these. The Nordics of the ancient ages celebrated their warriors. They molded their society following the will of the gods to fight, to win, to triumph. When they die in battle, the Valkyries descended and chose from them among the dead those who proved themselves to be Odin's own. Their obedience to their blood rewarded them with lands, loot, power, and above all, victory. Theirs was an ideal existence, unhampered by such uh, pedestrian concerns as survival. To become worthy of the fewer in the Germans, we will emulate these Vikings and their myths and legends. The Aryans of Russia shall make battlefields their home, fighting from the front lines, finding worthy death as an end. War shall choose who among us is true, pure, and righteous. No more shall the chosen people be held back from its true destiny as the great warriors of the dawning age. I like the sound of that one. The Persians of old. Uh, contemporaries of the Greeks were Aryans in the purest sense. They were the people that etched their name upon our race. The forefathers had begun the great awakening of our kind. Yet for all their fame and power, they seldom fought in the fields of battle, preferring to lord over lesser peoples who would do their fighting for them. Their empire spanned their home, their, their from homeland to the lands of the Jews and Arabs and to Anatolia before finally broken into Greece and the home of another chosen people. I wish to follow in their example. From now on, we shall only re reluctantly fight, for the numbers of the Brotherhood are thin as it is. The people shall, shall serve their new, better masters. Instead of warriors, we shall become overseers, and upon the shoulders of the Untermesh shall stand another empire, one stronger, greater than the old. I I'm, qu I'm going for the warrior cast. I feel like being warrior sounds cooler again uh, than the, um, the overseers. <laughs> Air Wolfgang, Arish, I don't know if that's correct. Welcome to the hall and enjoy yourself. The guard tipped down his hat and returned Wolfgang's papers. Don't cause too much trouble. The guard smirked and winked. Wolfgang gave the man his thanks and proceeded into the building. Opened the door to the dim of the beer hall, brothers young and old toasting. 
uh, toasting each other while slave girls worked in the aisles of the tables, carrying towering tankards of thick, sour brew. Ick picked a vacant seat and sat in it. He ordered a drink from a slave, addressing her curtly and without affection. When it arrived, he did not even uh, deign to thank her and took it without comment. While enjoying his pint, a group of posterous young men barged through the doors, exchanging crude jokes with one another. They were men from his platoon. He waved at them to come join him. Soon his table became crowded with comrades, brothers in arms, with whom he shared the highest bond, far beyond family, that binds them deeper and thicker than mere blood. Quiet, quiet, order, order. Men shouted as they cleared the centre of the hall, leaving a lone, a lone red-faced man standing at the table, stumbling drunkenly side to side in an effort not to fall. His friends laughed at him, jeering him to go on. He straightened his back and making an earnest face drew his breath. Comrades, brothers, countrymen. He started waving his arms wildly. He began his appeal without adornment, nor ostentation, though without elegance nor panache. His words, rallying against their inferiors, struck a chord with the crowd. His anger at the low station of the Aryans resonated with Wolfgang. He ended his tirade, saying, And this is what I suggest, brothers. A putsch, a putsch, a putsch against fate. To rage against it, to burn it out, out in the struggle, to rebel against our destiny, and make her own. The hall erupted into cheers, and Wolfgang himself repeating, uh, found himself re repeating the words. Once the Validium won war support. Fantastic. <laughs> Actually, I see bloody colds, man. Pre prepare raid against Uroli. Well, we could do that. They actually have more division than us, potentially. That is actually pathetic of us. What are we doing for equipment? Uh, what's our division template like? Oh! That's absolutely crap. That is absolutely awful. Former raiders. <coughs> so I feel like this is going to give us factories down here. Yeah, city of slaughter. That sounds. That sounds just fantastic. Strike at the heart, or strike at the arteries. Hmm. Yeah, it's got a couple more days until it's finished. Cool. Right, area more drill. Let's go ahead and do a city on the war footing. The decline of the city of Perm mirrors to a great extent the decline of the Russian race over the years. Just as we in ancient times were a proud and powerful people, now laid low by insipid monarchy and degenerate communism. Perm uh, was once the industrial centre of the region, but is now a shell of its former self, devastated by war and resource shortages. We know from the doctrine and example of the Germans that the only path to rejuvenate a race, uh, adlib by defeat and degeneracy, is war. Constant war. Without end, against all around us. Uh, Perhim, oh, I don't know, too, will be lifted up from the brink of destruction by war. We need to put military preparations above all else. As many of our resources as possible will be moved over to producing weapons and munitions. The city will reach its salvation, and its first step will be a ba uh, baptism by blood. Usually it's a baptism by fire, but blood just as nice, I guess. Arian Wardle. The bells rang early one morning. Last night's watch had returned, and now it is time for the Arians to practice their chosen art. Draped in camouflage, they went out of their barracks, sticking close to the undergrowth in case cases where a bomber might spot them. In the last few days, the scouts of the Brotherhood had marked blind spots in the German bombing, and indicated these in their area, uh, in their maps as training spots. There, they would reveal and study the mysteries of war to train themselves closer to the Viking ideal. Uh, Vilem, Vellum, a new initiate to the Brotherhood, stood at attention in the firing range while a senior brother explained to them the uses and ways of the rifle. He put the stock against his sh uh, shoulder and shot, hitting a target. He repeated this two more times, kneeling and prone. He reloaded and instructed them on how to clear a jam in the firing mechanism. And that is how you use a rifle, he said. A weapon so simple that even you maggots can't fail at it. He walked up and down the line of using every member of the platoon. When it came to Vellum's turn, he said, You, fake Aryan. I bet that you will fall on your rifle and shoot yourself. But today I am feeling optimistic. He laid his index finger on Vellum's chest, pressing it down to emphasise every word. You will go into the firing range and you will prove yourself worthy of bearing the blood. Am I understood? Uh, Vellum shouted, Sir, yes, sir. The brother gave him a slight nod. Good. 
After this was done, the recruits took their turns in the firing range. Bill improved himself to be a capable marksman, singled out by the brother as being the best in his platoon. At the end of the day, the brother gave him the ultimate honour. They dragged the slave out for the final spectacle. Bill took his aim and fired. A scream and then a silence. What the? What the hell? Buy stability 5 war support and replace Aryan Kilt with Aryan Kilt full Aryan military. Okay, so we're now minus 30% of the recruit population factor, but we have 20 division attack, 15 recovery rate, and 20 organization from it. So I guess it could be worse. But we do really have to start sorting out templates. Because what's the. Uh Do you know what? That one's only just slightly better. Like seriously, how is that only slightly better? Ah, I know, because it's for fucking light infantry. So, how strong are you? Five to seven, okay. Let's do the SAR. <laughs> He's gonna get put down very quickly, hopefully. And it's Gruber, Johann Schwartz, Lucas Otto, and Siegfried Schultz. Yep, banned from service, not surprised at that. I bet you all of this is like outlawed and you're not allowed to do any of it. So yep, 14 hour work day. Great, um, that's good. Right, now that's done. Work for your bread. Uh, Perheim's industry is a starving beast. Two wars and continued German bombings have annihilated its factories. And the vermin that make up the majority of the Russian population have not had the metal to rebuild them. At least not without encouragement. Although we are we are loath to give aid to the undeserving, we may have to make exceptions for pragmatic reasons. Perheim's undesirables have up until now been a given a meagre ration befitting of their race status. Volunteer for factory work may be taken as a sign of slightly greater racial vigour, at least in comparison to the rest of the ship uh, snivelling horde. This does not mean that we will be kind. The work will be harsh and unforgiven, with long hours and difficult conditions. But some among the Aryan cast, uh, many cringe at the thought of mercy to the savages. Small concessions are necessary to keep the system running. More for your life. For every day we neglect to reopen our factories, our chance to build a state even approaching the glory of the Reich gets further away. Erheim's industrial capacity has been severely diminished by the ravages of war. Efforts to continue industrial development have been derailed in part because of the unwillingness of non aryan population to work. While Permheim dies around them, these subhumans refuse to make sacrifices to save it. Perhaps you have forced them. There are thousands of able-bodied men and women of the lower castes throughout uh, Permheim, more than enough to fill our industrial needs. Our raider squads, usually put to work acquiring manpower outside of Permheim, can easily be redirected within it. The lesser races are more resources than men. Let us utilize every one of them. We have at our disposal, work never ending. Labour for your betters. Right, let's read both of these as well, just to cut a full understanding. Dim light, screeching metal, and harsh barking orders. These were known as the Aryan Three by the workers of the Perheim Munitions Factory, number 12A. That was considered to be an understatement of the true conditions of the factory. Even though the uncomfortable long shifts that all the workers were forced to take, outdated machinery, as for lack of any safety hazards, and the Aryan Brotherhood's overseers, perhaps more akin to the slave drivers, were all endemic to the fact all the factories in Perheim, which have seemingly worked day and night to churn out weapons missions for the Aryan state. The treatment of the workers who kneeled over simply unable to go on was monstrous. Being shot was lucky. <laughs> Ivan woke up at every morning with a smile on his face. Despite his withered frame and worn clothes, uh, Ivan woke up happy because he knew that he would be fed that day. The long hours gruelingly to most others and the utter lack of any safety precautions that would certainly better uh, deter many a labourer were dis regarded by the middle-aged Russian. He fought in the Great Patriotic War and survived, only in the this the collapse of the Union. He survived not just the war, but genocide, harsh winters, bandits and famine. Famine was the worst of all to Ivan, who dreamed only of the bits of bread and soup he would earn, toiling away, making bullets for the Aryan Brotherhood. He cared not of their dogma. Ivan had lost his convictions long ago. Now he only hoped to survive, and ironically enough, the Brotherhood was helping him to do that. Right, we're gonna go work for your bread. I don't want to be a complete dick to the uh, the civilians. Oh, oh, uh, that is that is completely uncalled for. Oh my days, they're not reading. Anyways, we've got an ultimatum. We will not bar back down. Uh, 
Yeah, we should hopefully win that. <laughs> Repeat after me. I swear to uphold the values of my race, to honour my ancestors with every action, and to defend my nation to the dying breath. The hooded, hooded figure intoned these vows from his elevated seat in a deep, clear voice like the toll of a church bell. Two kneeling men, soon to be initiates in the Brotherhood, followed along dutifully. After several days of, of elaborate rituals, their entrance into the ranks of the master race was just minutes away. As he spoke, the recruiter looked each one over and made his judgments. The first was a, a lanky peasant with coal blue eyes and a cruel contingent. Countenance. Countenance? He was nothing more than a jumped up farm boy off for blood. A thug, not an eerie. The second man was far more intriguing. As far as anyone could tell, he was only a recent arrival to Hyperion, pulled there in uh, exorbitantly by his vision of paradise. His zeal practically radiated off of him, and it was clear from his words that he was a talented speaker. The men, their oaths recited, waited patiently for the recruiter's next instructions. Rather than speaking, he pulled his revolver from his holster and threw it down, clattering onto the floor. Whichever one is worthy, kill your compatriot. Without hesitation, the outsider scrambled with the gun and fired a round into his partner's throat, the round abruptly cutting off his protest. As the dying man uh, gurgled noisily on his own blood, the recruiter was overjoyed. He had been right to see the newcomer's potential. Brother, congratulations! You're officially a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, with all the privileges it entails. Tell me, what is your name? It's Siegfried Schultz, and I intend to advance far in the Brotherhood's ranks. Wait, isn't that one of these? Yeah, he's right here. Okay. Dawn looms over Perheim, illuminating the cobbled roads and rotten-smelling markets. Men and women dressed in shabby rags, clamber out of their homes for the day's, uh, day's daily toil. Children play amid his quiet streets, laughing and keeping a watchful eye to the skies. Dressed in the fox fell growl, the men of the Brotherhood patrol the streets in the m and man the anti-air emplacements from the city. The thump of their well-shined boots sends the young ones scurrying to the shadows, their timber more fearsome than any bomber can summon. The one dil dilapidated and abandoned corner of the city walks senior brother uh, Valdemir alone with his partner absent, writhing in bed and uh, enduring a fever. Valdemar uh, paid his worry no heed. If the man is airy enough, he will recover. Besides, in his absence, no one would rat out his uh, dereliction of duty. The choice to spend his free time, however, is not nearly as liberating. In the district he patrols, there is nothing but broken and shattered buildings and rats, save for one squat and run-down bar. Stepping into it, he hails the waiter. This bar is a shameful establishment, says Valdemar. I order the full cup of sour beer and be quick about it. I, oh, uh, the Brotherhood shall hand flow your payment. The owner, flush face, went to fetch a dusty tanker and washed it in the dirty water. Valmar sighs. No other choice. A few months later, his drink would arrive, foaming at its rings. He did not uh, deign to drink it. Meeting the owner's gaze, he says, You seem to be holding something in. Something in, Hunter Minch. Speak, slave, or forever hold your peace. The owner seems struck and began. Your people cannot do this to us. One day, the will of Russia will rise and crush you. Besides, are you not also Rush... He hardly turned up. I've heard enough, he says. The Brotherhood plans for us all, and you will not stop us. He stands and spits in his pint. We will pay for this. We will pay for this portion. Threw open the doors and stormed out. Okay, that gave us two steel, one more support, and five political power. Don't know how, because that didn't really seem to be a good thing that happened there. So it appeared not all of the Russians are for us. Which, surprisingly enough, really shouldn't be shocking considering we're trying to align ourselves with the Germans. This is actually still ongoing. Why, why aren't you guys... Oh, you are fighting. I think we're going to be winning this. Ha ha ha, we're going to win. Yep, the enemy is defeated. Nice. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and scavenge for loot as well. Then if we get two, we can go ahead and do one of these. Which wouldn't be disastrous, actually. Oh, vodka. Vodka vodka. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Right, we'll see. We'll finish this focus, and then I think what we'll do is we'll leave that episode there. This has already been 30 minutes. And we've only reached May. Ah, TNO. The role playing game. The Croatian Autumn. Yeah, there it is, the Croatian Autumn. Labour for your nation, we've already read that, so I'll just go ahead and start it. And happy and joyous labour. 
Sergei wakes up an hour before dawn every morning. He gets up and kneels at the bedpost of his small room, praying to the Trinity for his daily bread, after which he dresses up in his coarse garments. The landlord, Arian, never so much glances at him, nor wonder at his absence. All that matters to that squat little man is his rent. Until recently, however, Sergei could not pay him, subsiding on hard labour in his pity. Yesterday, however, caused a, a radical change in Sergei's life. The local Brotherhood Patrol brought something other than terror. Jobs. From 6 in the morning to 10 in the evening, with extra rations and a little more pay, enough so that his landlord should not force him to sleep in the cold. Today, Sergei's pace is lighter than usual. Happy that he has work, with money and food waiting on the other side of the day. The plant is near his home, only a block away from where he lives. When he opened the doors to its floors, he found a few hundred men and women working on their respective tables, assembled in the lines and ranks, with rusty and unwielding tool, tools laid in front of them. Deeper into the factory, the sound of heavy machinery labouring roared into the ceilings, bounced off the walls on its way down. The brothers, clad in their grey attire, watched them closely. Sometimes they would take an insubordinate worker outside and beat them, but so far, Sergei could not hear any gunshots. When lunch comes, the Brotherhood upholds its word, serving both uh, broth and bread before sending them back to work. At ten and even as promised, they let them go. The commanding officer gives them their pay as well as some bread for dinner. Sergei has never worked as hard in his life, nor has he ever been in so much terror. As soon as he entered his room, he collapsed, forgetting his nightly prayer. So, willing, willing, a willing labour force. How have we managed to get a willing labour force? That is actually a very nice national spirit. A very nice. But anyways, guys, I'm going to leave that episode there. So thank you very much for watching. I do apologize for my nose blowing. Can't help it. But um, I will be back tomorrow with another episode of this where we'll continue to, um, well, get a better understanding of what's going on in the Avian Brotherhood. But until next time, guys, do take care. Cheer bye. The now.